Hallelujah. Welcome back to the exciting study of 2 Samuel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I know um, many of you may not remember or may not even have noticed, but we did not finish 2 Samuel chapter 14. And there's a reason that we didn't finish 2 Samuel chapter 14. Because as I started moving forward and y'all began to show me that um, I misread one of, one, of his, one of his signs, one of his types, you know. And so I have to make an error correction. Hallelujah. I must say, oops. My bad, because mm -hmm. um, I, me I messed up, you know. Uh, I depicted <clears throat> Absalom as Yahshua, and that is not the type. He is not as Yahshua. He is as Yahshua's son in type and shadow, you know. And so, essentially, this lesson is dedicated to the Absalom syndrome. You know, Absalom plays a huge part in these next um, few chapters. I mean, and so we need to get a proper understanding for what's going on. For certain, King David is a type of Yahushua, and Absalom was the son of David. There, and, and thereby depicts the spiritual son of Yahushua and not Yahushua himself. Therefore, Absalom's revenge on Amnon, i.e. the faithful, speaks to the destruction of those that raped the upright, um, which uh, was depicted by Tamar. That is the destruction of the Levitical priesthood and the temple. It still speaks to the end times as well, but not with Absalom as Yahushua, but as a wicked son of David, Yahu, um, or wicked son of Yahushua. Now, which is filled with hatred and vengeance towards his own brethren. Yeah, some Absalom's out here now, huh? Mm. Say a lot. So, you know, that's that's the uh, the proper type and shadow for uh, for Absalom. And so we're gonna pick up where where um, we left off in chapter fourteen. But before we do, you know, I want to you know just show. In 2 Samuel 3, 2 and 3, it says, And unto David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon, a kingdom, um, of a kingdom of the Jezreelites. And his second was Kiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And the third, Absalom, the son of Ma'akah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. And, you know, so here it is. We see this is when Absalom was born. He was born in Hebron. You know, and David, i.e. the beloved, speaks to Yahushua, who is married and gives birth through Ma'akah. And this is important to, to note, because if David is represented as a type of Yahushua, then we see here Yahushua giving birth through Ma'akah, and he gives birth to Absalom. This is how Absalom comes into being. So the spiritual picture here is our beloved Yahushua, you know, who's married to Ma'akah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and he has a child. Now, I'm going to attempt to show you this in scripture, spiritually speaking, right? Okay, so Luke 4, 28 and 29 says, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city. Now, they're talking about our Messiah, Yahushua, okay? You know, um, he was speaking in the synagogue, and everybody who heard it were fi was filled with wrath. They rose up and they thrust him out of the city. And it goes on to say, and led him unto the brow, to the brow of the hill, whereupon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. They was trying to throw him on top of his head off the, um, off a cliff. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. You know, this is the type of. This is what he was married to. This is Maka. This is the pressure, the, the oppression, the persecution in which our Messiah was married to. You know, um, also, we see another uh, aspect of it or another uh, 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 passage that speaks to it. It says in Yochanan 5, 16 through 18, And therefore did the Yahudim persecute Yahushua and sought to slay him. 
because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now here it is. He healed somebody. He was healing folks on, on the Sabbath and they had, a, they had a gripe with that. Not because the people were healed, you know, but because of the time in, that, in which he done it. So, you know, it's not, a, it's, it's okay to not do, um, to not, um, it's not okay to do good on the Sabbath. That's what they were saying. But Yahushua said, answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore, the Yahudim sought more to kill him. Because now, here it is, um, you saying, um, he your father, like you equal with him? Um, well, let me let the uh, scripture say it for itself. Therefore, Yahudim sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that Elohim was his father, making him equal with Elohim. You know, so, yes, this is the type of pressure that our Messiah, Yahushua, was married to. You know, all the days of his, of his ministry, you know, and maybe all the days, uh, um, well, definitely of his ministry, when he be, began to go forth and speak the words of Elohim, you know, unto the people by way of ministry, you know, uh, he came up, he was married to a tremendous pressure, you know. Uh, I wonder if my, my Akai was a fat lady because, you know, he had big pressure on his life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, he had a lot of pressure. I'm just saying it was a lot of pressure. It was, it was a lot of oppression that he had to deal with, you know. Now, Yahushua and my Akai, that pressure, that oppression, that persecution that he had, that he had married, that he was married to, gave birth to two beautiful children, though. The first was a spiritual Absalom. And, you know, I'm going to seek to show you the spiritual Absalom, Matthew 10, 16 through 18. It says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You know, the point that I want to point out is that... Uh, he sent them forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. How much pressure is that? So you see that even those that come from him, that um, you know, that come as a result of that seed of his seed, i.e., his word of Elohim that was given unto him, had to also go through. Ma'akai had to go through that pressure, you know, and they would be birthed from his word, his seed, the word of Elohim, and that pressure. It goes on in verses 17 and 18 says, um, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before the um, governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. You know, so we see those who would endure this, you know, who would come through this, they would be birthed from that, from that pressure. Also, we see in Yochanan, 1810 it says and Simon Peter having a sword drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. Okay, now all that pressure will get to you after a while. You know? So truly he did bring some through that pressure, through Maaka, you know, on um, that pressure, that oppression, that persecution that he was married to. You know, and also, let's consider Luke 9, 54 through 56. It says, And when his disciples, James and John, saw, that, saw this, they said, Adonai, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You know, now... As you can see, you know, Absalom came through that persecution, but Absalom was filled with vengeance and hatred, you know, for because of that persecution. You know, so he wanted to cut ears off. You know, he wanted to he wanted to uh, command fire to come down from heaven and consume people. You understand? You know, see, this is what Absalom wanted to do, spiritual Absalom wanted to do, even as physical Absalom um, did in many respects. You know, but our Messiah was trying to teach him better. He says, you know not what, what manner of spirit ye are. No, he didn't come to destroy, but to save. You know, now, Absalom's name means 
father's peace or my father is peace and surely his father was peace surely Yahushua was um, very peaceful and King David during that during this time was was at peace you know but Absalom you know wouldn't turn out to be so peaceful even though his father was now the second child that Malachi and Yahushua that is that that persecution and and Yahushua would give birth to um, would give birth to was Tamar Absalom's sister you know in 2 Samuel 13 1 we read it says and it came to pass after this that Absalom the son of David had a fair sister whose name was Tamar and Amnon the son of David loved her you know and so we see that Absalom was not the only child that was um, that was born through that persecution, that oppression, you know, that pressure, but also a beautiful lady by the name of Tamar was also born, which speaks to righteousness. And so we see, spiritually speaking, that through the seed of Yahushua, that is the word of Elohim that was given to him, and the persecution, Ma'aka, the pressure and persecution, you know, it also gave birth not only to Absalom, but it also gave birth to a daughter that was beautiful and was upright like a palm tree. Righteous. You know, Matthew Yahoo 520 says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now we know that some of them did enter in, and that was because they were as Tamar, their righteousness did exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, um, so much so that our Messiah uh, would even teach, you know, to make sure that Tamar was born. said, but seek ye first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness, mm -hmm. and all these things shall be added unto you, speaking of your earthly needs. And again, you know, we can see that, you know, even though he sent them through, even though he, he, they had to come through, they had to be birthed through Ma'aka, they had to be birthed through persecution and pressure, or ha, maybe I should say, has to be, have to be birthed through persecution and pressure, you know, that they still was able to acquire Yah's righteousness, you know, because they sought it out. And the same thing for not, for those of us today, you know, who is, who are birthed through this, uh, pressure this persecution you know we're to seek the kingdom of Elohim first and his righteousness we to have our righteousness to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees amen? amen you know and we do that with Yahshua's commands words and sayings you know and this is the way that righteousness is birthed you know I want you to uh, uh, well I'll get to that later um, <clears throat> 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Mashiach, Yahushua, shall suffer persecution. You know, and if we're going to be one of those righteous, if we're going to be Tamar, then we're going to have to be, we're going to have to come through that persecution, that pressure, that oppression. You know, and that's what many of, uh, of you feel, you know, have felt and feel, you know, dealing with your families, you know, um, and how they come up against um, you trying to just simply live your life in accordance to the word. You know? Um, and, and that's why I always, you know, my advice to all of you is always the same thing. As long as you can go to the word and show, you know, why you do what you do, then let the uh, chips fall where they may. Okay? Uh, are these two children? One was spoiled through Ray, and of course we know that to be Tamar, you know. Now, what happened during this, this rape, you know, they, you know, they were taken advantage of. And see, many of us that come through this persecution, this pressure, and that we're birthed in and we, and we become this beautiful Tamar, you know, we're raped by the faithful. Yeah. Even as Tamar was raped, raped by the faithful. Remember who the faithful represented in, in chapter 14? Represented the scribes and the Pharisees and the um, priests. Mm -hmm. It represented those who were actually in charge of Yah's temple. And it's no different now today. They're still raping Tamars all over the globe. 
you know, and they're putting their wicked seed in Tamar. And they're polluting her and spoiling her. You know, and remember, the seed represents the word of Elohim. They're putting that wicked seed into Yahushua's righteous daughter. And they're polluting her. You know, um, and because of this, it says, it tells us that Tamar was therefore removed from society. Hence, we're told that she remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. You know, so now she's destined to, spiritually speaking, even now today, she's destined to, to stay in her brother Absalom's house. You know, and that's where she stays until, you know, uh, pretty much her death. That's where she stayed. You know, now, the other child of this union was Absalom. And as we've seen and we're going to you know, further see, he was consumed by hatred and vengeance, which was ignited by the rape of his sister. He just couldn't get over it. You know? And, you know, and it's an ugly thing, you know, to take advantage of righteousness, to take advantage of someone that's upright. You know, and it, it can fill you with, with indignation. You know, but when it's fueled by hatred and vengeance, that is not of Yah. Hence, he plots his vengeance upon those responsible and brings about the destruction of the priesthood in the temple. And so we see that, you know, spiritually speaking, we see that, that the faithful were destroyed. The, the rulers of the temple, they were destroyed. And guess what? They're going to be destroyed again. You can trust and believe that. Because it's nothing new under the sun. Everything that happens is going to happen again. One of the wisest men that ever walked the earth taught us that. Which was another son of David, Solomon. Now, Absalom was eventually allowed to return to the kingdom. You know, and, and this is uh, where we left off in 2 Samuel 14, verses 24 through 26. My first reader, please. And the king said unto let him turn to his own house, and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his house, and saw not the king's face. But in all Israel there was none to be so much praise as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he polled his head, for it was at every year's end that he polled it, because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he polled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. Son of man. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Okay. okay, so now Absalom eventually was allowed to return to the kingdom. As we can see in verse 24, the king said, let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. You know, now, there's a whole lot going on here. But it seems to be, now this, this is supposition on my part, you know, there's nothing in the scripture that, that, that explicitly states this, but it seems to be that Absalom was on some type of house arrest, you know, that he was allowed to, to turn to his own house, you know, because that's all that we hear about is him being in his house, and um, he doesn't leave until after he sees the king's face, you know. So it seems to be that, you know, he was allowed to return, but as a punishment, you know, he had to, he had to remain in his house or on his property. You know, not to mention that, you know, uh, the revenger of blood, you know, may have been looking, looking to um, take vengeance, too. You know, even if, uh, if King David had reversed that rule, you know, that law, you know, some may have still tried it. You know, anyhow, because they could have been filled with vengeance, you know, and hatred, right? You know, so, uh, but we see here, the king does explicitly say, let him turn to his own house. Don't go nowhere else, you know, go to your own house. And he can't see my face, you know. But nevertheless, it says, but in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised. As Absalom. 
You know, now I want you to know that Absalom is actually, uh, he's a type of uh, the son of um, of Yahushua, but he's also a type of the, of the enemy. You know, and, and even within this story, the, the son of David was, was his enemy, was he not? You know, he's a type of the enemy, you know, um, type of the enemy in, in every aspect. You know, it speaks of um, him saying that there was no blemish, you know, um, he was praised for his beauty. Well, there's another. The, um, the enemy is also depicted as being um, very, very beautiful, you know. And Ezekiel 28, 12, and 13, you know, uh, we see a passage speaking about the king of Tyre, but we know that it speaks to more than just the, the physical king of Tyre, you know, because of um, what the context of the passage. It says, Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Adonai Yahuwah, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. So you see, you know, even as Absalom was perfect in beauty, from the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish. So you can see both of them was perfect in beauty, can you not? You know, Thus saith the Adonai Yahuwah, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. And we're going we're gonna to see how wise he was, too, because he, he was a wise guy. It says, thou hast been, well, we've seen some already, how he plotted against, uh, against his brother and, and slew him. Mm -hmm. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Now, there, there's no man that's been in Eden, uh, Eden, the garden of Elohim. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald. And the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day thou was created. Yeah. You know, yeah. we just, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that they're not talking about an ordinary man, right? You know, and I want you to also consider that Judah's name can and does speak to being praised or celebrated. And there was none to be so much praised as Absalom, right? So I'm, I'm trying to get you to see this 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 picture here, the spiritual picture that's being painted. You know, verses um 27 and 20, 27 through 30. My next reader, please. Uh, 2 Samuel 14, 27 through 30. And uh, uh, and unto Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of fair countenance. So Absalom dwelt, I'm sorry, so Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Which one? Okay, therefore Absalom sent for Joab to have, to have sent him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Therefore he said unto his servants, See, Joab's field is near me, and he hath barley there. Go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servant set the field on fire. Hallelujah. Real nice guy, huh? You know. We know another one that set, set stuff on fire too, right? But here it is. It says, uh, and Absalom, and unto Absalom was born three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. Hello. Hi, Tamar. Um, she was a woman of fair continence. She's back. You know, when you look at all of David's children, there was only one that was spoken of that really didn't have any um any strike against them. You know, and that's Tamar. You know, and her name means a palm tree and she represents the righteous, the upright. And here it is, even after she was spoiled, we see that she comes back on the scene later on, you know, through Absalom. So she comes back as a daughter of Absalom, spiritually speaking of course, right? Um you know, so, but the point that I'm making is that when we looked at the first Tamar represented the ecclesia, the righteousness 
you know, the one that was born through the word of Yahshua and the persecution, right? You know, so this is a spiritual picture that the ecclesia will once again be upon the earth. You know, yeah, you know, and she's gonna be just as beautiful. This time she's not gonna get raped. You know. So Absalom dwelt two full years in, in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. You know, and, and so here it is, uh we also we also wanna um take notice of these numbers. Two hundred means speaking to insufficiency. You know, um he pulled his hair, it was two hundred shekels. Uh, speaks to insufficiency, so we see insufficiency uh, uh, marks his life. He, he'll be insufficient. And number two, you know, which represents division, you know, and he truly will cause division. You know, he will divide the house of um, David as well as the nation in all actuality, right? You know, so hereby we see Absalom gives birth to another beautiful Tamar, you know, uh, and in verse 29 we saw, but he would not come in, it says, for Absalom sent to Joab to have sent him to the king. Now this is part of the reason that made me think that he was on house arrest. Because um, outside of that, he, he'd just go over his house. Just go and tell. You, you see what I'm saying? You know, he says, therefore Absalom sent to Joab to ha have sent to the king, but he would not come to him. You know, he wanted to talk to him, but he wouldn't come to him. And when he sent again a second time, he would not come. You know, and this is what, another thing that really makes me think that he may have been on house arrest. You know, so, therefore he said unto his servants, See, your house field is near mine. He have barley there. Go and set it on fire. Wow. You know, now you have to remember, Yoab name means whose father is Yah. So spiritually speaking, we're talking about him sending to whose father is Yah to come to him. And because he doesn't come, he destroys his barley. Now, barley speaks to the first fruits of Israel, which belong to Yah. So this, this is a, a spiritual picture of Yah's people being destroyed. You know, uh, he, he set the barley uh, on fire. So it speaks to the persecution and oppression of, of Yah's people. You know, now, so he figured out a way, saying, seeing, seeing Yoab won't come to me, I'll I, I, I figure out a way to get him to come see me. You know, so he was wise. You know, just uh, not in a good way, right? You know, Ezekiel 28, 17 speaks to someone else that was um, likewise. It says, thine heart, speaking of uh, the king of Tyrus again, you know, the enemy, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And then we can see the same thing has happened to Absalom. He's corrupted his wisdom. You know, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. You know, so that's what happened to the enemy. We're going to see what happened to, to Absalom. Verses 31 and 32 says, Then Joab arose and came to Absalom unto his house and said unto him, Wherefore hath thy servant set my field on fire? And Absalom answered, Joab, Behold, I sent unto you, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king to say, Wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me to have been there still. Now therefore let me see the king's face, and if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. Now, this is the very same thing that David said when he plotted against Yah's anointed um, king, i.e. King Saul. You know, and don't, don't think this is there by happenstance. That's just why we're supposed to put line upon line, right? Okay, so let's take a look and see where this line occurs, um, elsewhere where it occurs prior to this event. You know, and it's found in 1 Samuel 20, verses 5 through 8, and it deals with King David himself. It says, And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, but let me go that I may hide myself in the field until the third day at even. If thy father at all miss me, then say David earnestly ask leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. 
That is a flat out lie. That was a lie. You know, it goes on to say, if he say thus, it is well, thy servants shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore, thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant. For thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of Yahuwah with thee. Notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. And you see that? You know, uh, for why wouldest thou bring me to thy father? So here it is. We see that with the very same words, with the very same same words, you know, that, uh, that David used when he was plotting against, uh, when he was deceiving the anointed king of Elohim, is the very same words that his son was using to uh, deceive the anointed king of Elohim, even himself. You know, don't think that's there by happenstance. All right, so that's the end of chapter 14. And so uh, we're going to go on to the study of 2 Samuel chapter 15. I don't think we're going to get all the way through it, but we'll get some done, okay? Let me have my next reader read 2 Samuel 15, 1 through 6. Continuing on with the story um, of Absalom. And it came to pass after this that... Uh, Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, that then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, my servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. <clears throat> Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came night to him to do him of obedience, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this matter did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the heart of the man of Israel. Okay, hallelujah, thank you. Uh, I want to see something for a second. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed, a, missed a verse. Uh, 2 Samuel 14 ends with verse 33, which says, So Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself uh, on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. You know, and so, therefore, you know, um, we see from here that it seems like he gets off house arrest. Mm -hmm. For when we pick it up in chapter 15, it says he came to pass that Absalom prepared chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now, why would he be doing all that? You know, a um, uh, couple of reasons. You know, for one, if that revenge of death was still out there, they're not about to come at him with, with these 50 men he got running before him. You know, um, you know, uh, and another reason he could have just been happy, you know. But I kind of think it's the uh, former, you know. But nevertheless, he had 50 men to run before him. You know, and it says that he stood by the gate, you know, and he, he began to put his, his plot into, into, uh, um, into action. You know, he stood by the gate and he started, you know, putting the king down. You know, saying, you know, there's no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Oh, that I were made judge in the land. You know, I'd do such a better job. You know, I would do you justice. You know, um, but we just read about a woman who had an issue who went to the king and the king 
um, hurt her. You know, so maybe it was true that he hadn't deputed the king, uh, a man, you know, for that purpose, but he was doing it himself. It's not like the job wasn't getting done. Amen? Amen. The job was still getting done. You know, just like uh, now, you know, Yahushua hasn't deputed anyone to hear, the mat hear our matters. He, you know, but uh, we can go to him ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. You know? You know, we can go to our father. We can go to the father ourselves. You know, and we can still still be heard. All right, so it says that through this scheme, Absalom stole the, stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You know, now Exodus twenty eight. Uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel twenty eight twelve, who speaks about you know, seems to speak about the enemy. You know, also says, "Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king Tyrus and say unto him." Thou say, thus say of the Adonai Yahuwah, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom. And we see that here it is. Absalom was a very wise man, but, you know, he used that wisdom in the wrong way. You know, he corrupted his wisdom. And, you know, he here it is. Uh, he's making himself seem like, you know, he's this good guy and he's there for the benefit of the people. But overall, he has, he has a, uh, this scheme has a deeper plot, you know, and still within it. You know, and there's another one that does the same thing, even Hasatan, 2 Corinthians 11, 14, it says, No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know, he stands in and he tries to, you know, show you how things should be, you know, and try to put himself in the place of Yah, you know, and show you all the reasons why you don't need Yah. You know, all you need is him, you know. Uh, but, you know, that's why you have to stick to Yah's word so that you don't get led astray, you know. But it does say that Absalom stole the hearts of the people, hearts of the men of Israel with, with the scheme, right? All right. Um, verses 7 through 9 goes on to say, and it came to pass after 40 years. Now, there's a lot of uh, speculation over this 40 years here. Some people says. It's a typo or um, it's a mistake. It should be four years. Some people say it was 40 years, I mean, um, you know, um, uh, since there were kings. And there's all kind of exclamations for this, you know. Who knows? Um, I don't know. Uh, all I know is what the, what the script says. It says 40, so we're going to roll with 40, right? You know. And 40 represents tests and trials. You know, so it came to pass that after 40 years after the test and trial, that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto Yahuwah in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode in Geshur in Syria, saying, if Yahuwah shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve Yahuwah. And the king said unto him, go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron, lying through his teeth, lying through his teeth. You know, just like the enemy does. You know, you, you can see the enemy through his character all the way through. You know, through and through. You know, but he was going on his way to Hebron, which means association or alliance, right? Or even friendship. Okay? Now, there was another one that, that used to lie like that all the time. You know, even, even the enemy, even the devil, right? Yochanan 844. You know, the Messiah was, was speaking. He said, ye are... Ye are of your father the devil. The lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speak of a lie, he speak of, of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. You know, so here it is. We see, you know, our, our boy Absalom, you know, he's, he's beautiful and all, but he's really, he really aligns up, you know, really well with the enemy, does he not? You know, now, I'm going to try to open your eyes to the spiritual pick that's being presented here. This, patch, this passage is, is actually a, a spiritual picture of how Yahushua would be betrayed by Judas hundreds of years prior to it happening. You know, it may even be one of the ways that Yahushua knew it would happen himself. For scripture teaches the end from the beginning, you know, and I believe... Hebrews 4.15, when it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted 
like as we are, yet without sin. You know, I believe that. I believe that our Messiah, Yahushua, you know, even being the son of Elohim was actually also an ordinary man. And was tempted just like we're tempted. You know, only difference is he was without sin. He got it right. He got it right so he could show us how to get it right. Amen. 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 You know, so due to this verse and others, I believe that the setting for Yahushua was the same as it is for us today. Yes. We can know what will happen if we correctly interpret scripture. Yes. You know, just like our Messiah knew what was going to happen because he knew the word. Yes. You know, you know, uh, 2 Samuel 15, 10 says, but Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in heaven. Yes. You know, now, I want to uh, call your attention to, to the picture here, To What we have here is the enemy going to Hebron. So we had an enemy going to an associate or an alliance. Can you see that? You know, this is a, a picture of the enemy going to an associate on a, on a line. So we know Absalom represents the enemy. He's going to Hebron. He's going to an associate or an alliance. You know, he sent spies throughout all the land. Say, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And now, here, we're being um, shown that Absalom has committed treason against King David. Even as... Judas committed treason against King Yahushua. Yeah. And as our adversary has done against Yah. Yeah. Yes, Yahoo 14, 13 through 14 is speaking of Lucifer. You know, says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Elohim. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So here it is. Again, we see Absalom aligning perfectly with the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, just as he wanted to take a... Uh, uh, a throne that wasn't his, even as the enemy seeks to take the throne that's not his. You know, as he sought to take his father's throne, Absalom sought to take his father's throne, you know, we see the enemy, Lucifer, seeking to take even Yah's throne, the audacity. You know. So, the important thing here to see is that he's going into Hebron. We see the enemy going into Hebron, going into an associate or an alliance. Now, the same thing happened to our Messiah, Yahushua. You know, in Luke 22, 3, we see the exact same thing. Then enter Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being another number of 12. Now, Judas was a friend of Yah's. He was an alliance. He was one of the 12 disciples that he confided in most. I mean, you know, knowing that Yahuwah never changes and that Yahushua was the same yesterday, today, and forever, we can also determine that the same will happen to the future sons of Elohim. It's not going to be any different. You know, we can know what's going to happen through Scripture just like our Messiah knew what was going to happen through Scripture. In Matthew 10, 34 through 39, it bears witness to this. It says, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. So many people still believe that the Messiah came to bring peace. He did not. He came to bring a sword. Now, we know the sword represents the word of Elohim. And yes, he brought that, the word of Elohim. But a sword, you know, by nature, divides. And that's what his word does. Verses 35 through 39 of Matthew Yahoo 10, for I am come to set at variance, not unity, at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. 
This is the way it was with David. This is the way it was with Yahushua. And this will be the way it will be with the sons of Elohim in the last days. Yes. It's not going to be any different. It goes on to say, he that love a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that love a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that take of not his cross and follow up after me is not worthy of me. He that find of his life, guess what? Shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. See, you have to understand this. You know, when he took up his torture stake, this or his cross, which was also referred to as a torture stake, he wasn't going to have a party. That's right. <laughs> he wasn't having a good time when he was carrying that. It was torturous. You know, and if you don't, if you don't accept that sword that he brought, that word of Elohim that will put you at variance with your very own family, that will cause you to be the foe in your very own household, don't you know that's a form of torture? That's a form of persecution, of oppression. I pray that you can see that that is ma'aka. Through the seed of Yahushua, that is that sword, the word of Elohim and ma'aka, that pressure, that is how Tamar is born. You have to pick up that, that torture state. When you begin to pick up that torture state, you're going to lose your life. That's what he did on it. He, he died. He lost his life, right? But in losing his life, he gained it, did he not? Amen. See, and the same thing will happen to us. Now, I'm going to tell you, because I carry that torture state. I'm going to tell you, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You know, I'm not going to um, gloss it over. It's not no fun. Torture is no fun. Torture is no fun. It's no fun. But it wasn't meant to be fun. You know, I don't know about nobody else, but I live this. I live this. I lost my life. But I know and understand that in losing it, I actually gained it. But it's torture all the same. Now, just as Absalom did that, just as Judas did that, um, you know, Absalom committed treason and mutiny. Judas committed treason. And mutiny, and there's another, the enemy, he in the last days will also commit treason and mutiny. Revelation 12 7 tells us that there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. It's gonna go down one day soon. You know, I'm a, I don't know exactly when, but I can tell you one thing for absolute certainty. We're closer to it this week than last week. Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, we're closer than any other people has ever been in the history of humanity. That's the absolute truth, is it not? Yeah. Could be tomorrow. Could be next week. One thing for sure, we're getting closer. 2 Samuel 15, 11, and 12, and with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they were in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. This is huge. This teaches us that perhaps a majority of the soldiers that was with Judas didn't even know what their mission was that evening when they were going to get him. But even more so, it also teaches us that in the last days, Many of them are going to be deceived. They're not even going to know what they're, what they're doing, you know, when they're coming up against us. 
you know, they're just going to be pawns. They're just going to be being used. In some cases, they're just going to be doing their job. 2 Samuel 15, 12, and Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices and the conspiracy was strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. Now, Ahithophel, you know, his name means brother of foolishness or brother of ruin. Where he's from, Gilo, means uncovered or stripped, and this is exactly what he would become. He will become a brother of foolishness and he will become uncovered and stripped. Now, what we have here in verse 12 is a covenant or an alliance. Now, it's no, it's, this is not by happenstance. There, um, Absalom went to Hebron, which means, you know, um, communion. It means uh, association. It means alliance. And here it is. He's offering sacrifices to enter into an alliance with different key people. And this is what made the conspiracy strong. And this is why the people increased continually with Absalom, because he's like, okay, I'm gonna make you my general, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna have a good place in, in, in my kingdom. You know, so he's making these alliances, you know, and making the conspiracy strong. Can you see that? You know, now, we see here in verse 12, it's a, uh, it's a covenant or alliance with Satan, with David's son and David's friend and others. And this is just how it happened with Yahushua. This is the exact way it happened. You know, and when we look in Luke 22, 4 and 5, you know, it, go, it continues on and says, And he went his way and communed with the chief priest and the captain, speaking of Judas, right? Because we just read verse 3. You know, Satan entered into Judas, you know, and... Now we're being told, and he went his way and communed with the chief priests and the captains, how he might betray unto them. So can you see that him entering into Judas, he was entering into Hebron, he was entering into an associate, and alliance, and he went on and he made, he made um, a covenant, you know, uh, and a conspiracy with the chief priests and the captains. You know, the very same thing is happening. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. Mm. You know, and it's important that you understand this because the same way it was is the same way it's going to be when the sons of Elohim is on the earth. They're going to do the same thing. You know, I was running out of time, so I didn't have time to put the verses in here that actually speaks to them bribing the people during the time of the sons of Elohim. This very same thing is going to be going on. The same thing will be going on. So if we understand what's happening now, what happened then, we'll understand what's, what's going to happen in the future. You know, and it's really important that we get this because this could speak to us in the, in the years to come or speak to our children very easily. You know, now, remember, I said... You know, uh, what we have here is a covenant or alliance with Satan, David's son, and David's friends, his, his friend and others. You know, so I'm going to try to show you that um, the very same thing happened to the Messiah so that you can know and understand that it's going to happen to us too. They're not going to use strangers. They're going to use people of our own household. They're going to be using our friends. You know, they're going to be turning us in. Can you, you got to be able to see this. You know, now, first of all, I want, I want many people are unfamiliar with the concept that Yahushua was a father. So I want to show you that first. It begins with Yeshayahu 9.6. It says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty Elohim, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, most of us equate him as to be in all these things, but when it comes to the everlasting father, you know, we're like, yeah, like that. We just, we just pause, you know, and we don't say nothing, you know, but yes, he is the everlasting father. And I'm going to show you how so, spiritually speaking, he's the father of all of us. Um, when we look at 1 Timothy 1, 1 and 2, it says, Paul, an apostle of Yahushua, Mashiach, by the commandment of Elohim, our Savior, and Adonai, Yahushua, Mashiach, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, mm -hmm. grace, mercy, and peace from Elohim, our Father, and Yahushua, Mashiach, our Adonai. 
See, you can have a son, a spiritual son in the faith. See, in everything that we do in the Brick Kadashah, everything in, in Yahshua, in what Yahshua um, um, taught and brought about and exemplified is spiritual. It's spiritual. First the natural, then the spiritual. You know, and so this is what we're talking about. He's our spiritual. He, he's the everlasting father spiritually because he the one who brought all of us into the faith. All of us came into the faith because of his seed. The word of Elohim that was given unto him. Amen. You know, and this is the way that Paul, Apostle Paul was able to say Timothy was his own son because he brought him into the faith. Also in uh, second witness, Titus 1.4, to Titus my own son after the common faith. Now, just in case you don't know, Apostle Paul never married. He never married. You know, so he was, he's not talking about his biological children. My own son after the common faith. Grace and mercy. Peace from Elohim the Father and Adonai Yahushua Mashiach our Savior. So you see, you can have spiritual children. That's what I want you to see. And this is the way that our Messiah is the everlasting Father. You know, because... Through his seed, i.e. the word of Elohim, we all came into being. You know. Now, he was also, um, that, that shows the father, but the covenant was with Satan, um, David's son. And David's son speaks to Judas because he birthed him into the faith, did he not? You know, so he would have been a type of son of Yahshua's, even as Timothy was a type of son of Apostle Paul's. And Ahithophel truly was David's friend, you know, even as Judas was Yahshua's friend. Mm -hmm. And we learn this from Psalms 55, you know, which is a psalm of Dabiz. In verses 12 through 14, it says, for it, was not, for it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne him. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou. A man, my equal, my guide, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of Elohim and company. Whoa. That's deep, isn't it? You know, and it was the same thing with Judas, you know. He had been with him for three years. He had seen him raise the dead, heal the sick, you know. Um, the blind saw, the lame walked. The deaf heard. And he went and done this. Also in Psalms 41.9, he also speaks of it. Um, another song of David. It says, Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trust, which did eat of my bread, have lifted up his heel against me. See, so you have to understand. See, this is how Yahushua knew that it would happen. See, I, sometimes I think people think that, you know, Yahushua just, you know, um, had this all-knowing thing that, you know, he just knew, you know, it just was innate, that he just knew everything because he was, he was Elohim in the flesh, you know, that, you know, no, he was tempted just like us. He had the same temptations we had, you know, but he trusted and believed in the Heavenly Father and his word so much in the Ruach Kadesh that was upon him and the word of Elohim and it's correct interpretation, you know, he believed what it said and he he lived it out and he watched it come to pass in his life. And I'm here to tell you that if you do the same thing, it will be likewise. Even as he was resurrected, you'll be resurrected. He showed us the way. All we have to do is follow it. Second Samuel 15, 13 says, And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. You know, and this was a very important thing to get the hearts of the, of the, of the men. You know, because then the rest was easy. Mark 15, 11 shows that during the time of Yahushua, you know, they got the hearts of the men too. It says, But the chief priests moved the people that they should rather release Barabbas unto them. You know, they had the hearts of the people, so they was able to move them in which way they wanted. You know, and 
concerning where we seen it said that uh, um, concerning Absalom and how the conspiracy was strong and the people increased continually with him, we see the same thing is going to happen again. It happened during the time of our Messiah, so much so that they moved the people against that they should release Barabbas unto him. When here it is, this is the same guy that was healing their mamas, healing their daddies and their children. This is the same guy that was causing them to walk when they was lame, that was unplugging their ears when they were deaf, that was opening their eyes when they, was, when they could see that they chose to have him be crucified rather than a murderous rebel. You see? It's not going to be any different. It's not going to be any different. Now, how torturous do you think that was for our Messiah? You know, it's not going to be any different, you know, in the end times when the sons of Elohim is upon the earth. You know, and um, real talk, spiritually speaking, it, it won't be any different right now if you start walking this thing out correctly. You know, you'll see it. You'll see it. I guarantee it. You know, um, 2 Samuel 15, 14, And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee. But we shall not escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. Hereby we see King Dabi giving warning to those with him in Jerusalem. And this is the very same thing that Yahushua did with those who were with him in Jerusalem. He gave him warning of what was going to happen. In Matthew 26, 31 and 32, it says, Then say of Yah, who shall unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you in Galilee. Can you imagine them, how they was looking at him when he was saying this during that time? What do you mean? What are you talking about? You know, they're going to... You're going to be smiting, and then you're going to rise up, and you're going to go before us, you know, what they not, you know, huh? Speak plainly to us, please. You know, and this is what many of us are screaming out now today when, they, when we read the scripture, you know, because, you know, it's encoded, you know, and we look at the word and we say, speak plainly to me, you know. But I'm here to tell you, how it was is how it's going to be. We can see it happen in the, with the house of David, happen with Yahushua, and it's going to happen again with the sons of Elohim. You know, um, we're going to stop right here. We're going to pick it up from here when we start, when we start back. We're going to go over this slide again because this is, this is a, a pivotal point here. You know, this is... This is when the passion of the Messiah really starts going, and it's, and it's depicted here in this passage, you know, and it's, it's beautiful to see. So we're going to um, pick it up from here, so we're going to stop right here. We're going to say, to be continued, you know, hallelujah.